So over the past couple weeks here, we've, we've clued in to two of our five areas of focus. And, and uh, these are the areas of focus that, that here at the church, we believe we are called out uh, to, to live the, the vision for Christian community that God has, has placed upon us. Okay? And, and two weeks ago, we began by looking at worship, and worship was an opportunity for imitation of the Almighty. Okay? It was a time-honored tradition of glorifying God, not simply by participating in event, be it in person or online, but by living a lifestyle. Worship embraces a sacrifice of praise as, as a lifestyle worthy of God's call. Okay? Last week, we found that, that forgiveness is, is key to living a life of hospitality. Okay? Knowing firsthand the forgiveness of God, despite our own failures when we, when we misstep or when we misspeak or, or lash out for whatever reasons, it's paramount to providing a safety net in which people are able and willing to forge an authentic rapport with others and with, with God. Hospitality is contingent upon others being able to trust us, to trust that, that forgiveness is real, to trust that we are indeed representatives of the faith and the life and the God that we proclaim and profess to love with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Today, today we are encouraged to yield completely to Christ. To yield completely to Jesus through a life dedicated to discipleship. I want you to hear the word of God as it, as it comes to us from, from the Apostle Peter in his letter to the church uh, in Asia and Asia Minor. You are a people, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visited us. That he visits us. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you to understand the significance of Peter's language here. He's using language that, that has previously only been applied to the people of Israel. <laughs> what he's doing is instilling within believers that it doesn't matter what the world thinks. Belief does not cater to disbelief. And if you look at the descriptions that, that Peter uses to describe faithful ones, see words like chosen, People belonging to God, a priesthood declaring the praises of him who called you. Peter's using what we would, would, would call Old Testament language. And, and what he's doing is he's enlarging Israel's identity as a chosen nation. In reality, he's speaking of a new nation, a Christian nation. It's a nation truly under God and without borders, encompassing all nationalities, all shapes, all sizes, all colors, all ethnicities, all communities. Christians will be found anywhere and everywhere. And as believers, we're called to be holy and set apart for God. You got your Bibles, open them, uh, or you got the pew Bible, open it to Exodus 19. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6.
in Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, Peter's echoing back, okay? And, and, and when the God of all nation declares, God of all creation declares, he says this. Where's verse 5? Well, that's not what he said, but. If you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. A life of discipleship brings with it the blessing of God. You are a treasured nation. Disciples are a treasured possession set apart to declare the praises of the Almighty. Opening the door of our heart to Jesus grants us the blessing as children of God. And oh, what a blessing it is. Do you comprehend the magnitude of being valued by the creator of heaven and earth? God cherishes you, just as God cherishes me. And, and He cherishes everyone so deeply, He knows all there is to know about us. That says so much about divine love. King David understood just how important he was to God when he wrote the, the 139th Psalm. If you look at the 139th Psalm, I'm, I'm just going to share a couple of the verses uh, that, that come from that. Okay? He says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. You created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Folks, the attentiveness of God to his people is incredible. And so again I ask, do you know that you are valued by God? Loved above all by the creator of heaven and earth. Do you realize how much God loves you? If you do, if you do, you know the blessing of being one with God. And with this blessing comes responsibility. Responsibility to grow in grace through the daily practice of, of spiritual disciplines. And, and that is coupled with the responsibility to help others grow in grace as they turn their hearts to God and seek obedience to Christ. However, the responsibility doesn't fall on our abilities. The blessing from God brings with it our capacity to live a life of discipleship. It's embracing this responsibility that's the key to in growing in grace. God makes it possible. we got to want it. The question is, why should we even attempt it? Why should we attempt to grow in grace? Let me ask you this. Who's the most important person in your life? Now, I can come up with a list of people, okay? And I'm sure you can too. 
But who, excluding God at this point, who is the most important? Now, for most of us, our answer is going to be dependent upon the context in which the question is asked. If you ask me, while I'm here at church uh, throughout the week, that, that may well uh, answer, be answered according to the issue. Okay? If, if, if it's a staff issue, my most important person is likely going to be Bob Gropp, who's, who's the, the Staff Parish Relations Committee chairperson. If, if it's a finance issue, I may look to, to Ron Otney to be the most important person that I need to, to be in contact with. And, and if it's dealing with the direction of the church, I'll look to our lay leader, uh, Barb Port. And, and right on down the line, the person most important to me is dependent upon the situation I'm in. Or is it? You might say, well, what about your wife? Shouldn't Susan be the most important person in, in my life regardless of what's happening in the church? Or anywhere else? Well, yeah. That goes without saying, right? Okay? Of course it does. If you know me. If you don't know me. You might think I didn't name her because I didn't see her as all that important. I mean, she just got a, well, yeah. If you ask her, okay, if you ask her, I'm sure that she's going to respond with, I am so honored to be in the shadow that is cast by my husband that he never has to give me a second thought. I'll always be there for him. That's just how she is. Right? We'll talk later. The truth is, I've had moments in our marriage when I've taken Susan for granted. Regretfully, there have been moments in our 38 years of marriage that I have allowed her to feel dispensable, untreasured, unimportant, as I went about the Lord's work. Praise God that she's a forgiving soul. No one likes to be made to feel unimportant. Because no one is. And, and yet I as well, I imagine, as, as some of you have probably slid down this slippery slope on more than one occasion. It's hurtful. This afternoon, if you have chance, go home and, and look up Romans 8. Okay, in Romans 8, Paul tells us just how important we are. See, Paul thought we were so important that he believed that, that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor things present nor things to come nor power nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation would be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. That says we're pretty important to God. Folks, if anyone here believes that it is an honor to be taken for granted, I got news for you. You're wrong. You're not just mistaken, you're not just misled, you're just wrong. The most important people in our lives can never be honored by being taken for granted. But it's not just them. God is important. God doesn't like being taken for granted any more than you or I do. Remember, we are made in His image. That's how important that we are. God can never be honored by being taken for granted. Discipleship is the means by which we show God just how important God really is in our lives. It's the means by which we honor Him. Now as believers, we are set apart for sharing and declaring holiness and that can't be taken for granted. How we live as Christians 
influences how others view God in the church. As disciples, as disciples, we ought to authentic, authentically strive for unity within our heart through our thoughts, our words, our deeds, and our actions. This is the importance of consistent, faithful living. If the church is viewed as irrelevant, and you've probably heard that uh, time and again, if the church is viewed as irrelevant today, because the life that we are showing the world implies that God can indeed be taken for granted. At my last appointment, there were several people in the congregation who worked at the Pepsi plant in Franklin. They were very active within the church, so much so that, that Pepsi became the unofficial drink of the congregation. Coke products, of which I am a connoisseur, had no place. These folks were important to me, but they were not so influential that I changed from Coke to Pepsi. Their influence however great it was upon my life, proved insufficient to transform my taste buds. However, they came to appreciate who I was. And eventually, they made sure that there were at least a couple Cokes at every gathering. They were better people than I was. Now, my brother, my brother's a manager down at Harbor Freight. Anytime... I need anything of importance in the tool department. Harbor Freight's first choice comes to mind. I know it'll make my brother feel good. It'll put a smile on his face to know that I'm supporting him. My brother is so important to me that I feel guilty every time I walk into Home Depot and Lowe's. When I see him, when I talk to him, if I haven't checked out Harbor Freight first, I kind of shrug a little bit. But that's because of the time we spent together, the love that we have for each other, the experience that we have shared. He has been a huge influence on my life. And because of who he is and because of what he means, I check all of the Harbor Freight email ads as they come into my inbox. And i got to tell you, there are a lot of them. Guess what? Spending time with God. The experiences that we share with God, knowing what will put a smile on God's face, that's going to influence our choices if God's important to us. And then working to make what brings joy into God's heart, that's going to happen. That's more than important. As believers, those who proclaim to follow the one true God, we have a responsibility. We've got a responsibility to adhere to God's will on earth as it is in heaven, and it comes with the territory. It comes with being a believer. It's not always going to agree with society. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. So the question is, who's going to be a greater influence upon our lives, God or the world? We, as Christians, are a different culture. It's important to remember that at all times. However, that doesn't mean that we're to stand off from all who don't belong to God. You see, our goal, our goal is to not unnecessarily offend the ethical and moral expectations of our society. We're not here to live the life of the anti-whatever. We've got enough anti-movements going on in, in our world on, on every side of every situation. There are so many lines that are drawn in the sand that, that we can't move for fear of crossing the line with someone. Now the goal of believers 
is to be recognized as good people within the society in which we live without disobeying God. Why? Because being good by the standards of the world in which you are living opens the doors for the transforming grace of God to be transmitted through you. As long as the standards are lived without disobeying God. Your witness, my witness, just may be the means by which God inspires an unbeliever to repent and believe in the powerful presence of our gracious and merciful God. That doesn't mean when in Rome do as the Romans do. It means that we are so confident, so confident in who God is in our lives that we are not threatened, we are not shaken by who God is not in another's life. It means that you look out for those around you, whether they are believers or unbelievers, whether you like them or you don't like them. You help those who are in need. You feed the hungry, you clothe the naked, you care for the sick, you willingly seek out the lost. It means that regardless of our differences, morally, theologically, intellectually, culturally, whatever, we will treat others with honor and respect. And in this way, we will plant a seed of faith that waits for God to germinate it. To live out our vision to be a transforming, serving church, sharing the love of Jesus with all. To live that vision out means that we're going to take our blessings. We're going to grow in grace. We're going to share the witness of what God has done in our lives so that God will be glorified. God will be glorified through the life of worship in which we honor God in the ways we work, in the way we play, in the way we engage others in relationships. We're going to glorify God through the life of hospitality in which we are intentionally offering forgiveness to all. As we seek to build relationships with with all people, churched and unchurched alike, in order to share God's love. God will be glorified through the life of service wherein we join Jesus Christ in mission to others, using our God-given gifts, talents, and passions. God will be glorified through the life of generosity in which we strive to tithe and consciously work to reorder our lives to free up more resources to honor God and to bless others. Our desire, our desire in living a life of discipleship is to honor God with all of our heart. So I invite you to to commit not to taking God for granted, All that we have within us is meant to give God praise. To open the doors of our heart to Jesus and to fully embrace His vision of living. Every breath that we take, every moment that we're awake, we want God. We want God to have His way within us. So that we will continue to grow in grace and obedience by taking responsibility for for that growth in grace and obedience, we'll be inspired. Inspired to partner with God in aiding others so that they too may grow in grace and obedience to Jesus Christ. With every blessing comes responsibility. A life of discipleship is a 24-7 commitment at all times and in all places and all situations. It says, Lord, have your way in me. Amen?
ourselves to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. We're coming to the table of the Lord and we're saying, Lord, have your way in me. We're here for you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of this in remembrance of me. It's in remembrance of these acts in Jesus Christ that we come together now, trusting in the sure and certain hope Jesus Christ, 
is who he says he is. And the God has done all that God said he's done. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. As we prepare ourselves to receive these elements, is there anyone who's not received that does not have those at this time? is our opportunity for a new start, a new life, a living entirely for God. This is our time not to take God for granted, to wholly open ourselves to Him. Will you pray with me? Most gracious and almighty God, we know that we take you for granted way too much. We know, Lord, that, that in this moment, as we give you our heart, as we give you our soul, we're saying, Lord, have your way in me. We don't always love as we ought to love. We don't always live as we ought to live. 